glad Ralph is back. We missed him last week. I had to carry my own podium last week. <laughs> no sympathy, I know. In fact, I'm glad to see all of you here. Glad that we're on this side of the storm. Also aware there are many who are going to be gripping uh, and, and dealing with the consequences of for months, if not years to come. A dear friend of ministry who lives in Jackson, sorry, he lives in Atlantic Beach, it's just directly east of Jacksonville. His wife uh, evacuated to Tallahassee. He is in Korea right now. Uh, South Korea where they had a typhoon. So he's coming back from a typhoon to see what uh, his, his home looks like. So prayers for all those who were affected. Uh, Diane, one of our singers uh, in worship, sent me a, a message this week. There's a photograph taken of a bookstore, a Christian bookstore. On the, on the door, a big sign it said, Close for Hurricane Matthew. Fortunately, Mark, Luke, and John are behaving. <laughs> By the way, many of you were here last week, and just a, just a quick uh, update and appreciation. Uh, I, I am grateful for your indulging uh, 10 to 15 minutes at the start of the service to fill out a survey that I'm doing as a part of my doctoral studies. And phenomenally, we had over nine, well over 900 surveys that were completed and submitted. So thanks to all of you who were a part of that. And I also would say three or four people asked a question, so I'm going to answer it. Three or four folks said, well, why do you need to have my name on this consent form that's stapled to the survey? So let me, let me reiterate what I was trying to say. Federal law requires any survey or study that's done like this has permission, <coughs> consent form. So it has to be there. And then I told you, playfully and truthfully, that nobody would still ever know because we were going to separate those two immediately and, and it would be my special assistant, my dad, who is completely blind, <laughs> and sure enough, with a total of six hours last Sunday and Monday, he got them all separated into two piles. So thanks be to God for that. Now last week, last Sunday, we also stepped into the foyer of Romans 12. You may remember that at the end of chapter 11, Paul caps it off with a full-throated act of praise. He says, For from Him and through Him and for Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. That's the end of chapter 11. What comes next? Therefore. <laughs> I know you were listening. All right? Therefore. <laughs> Therefore. It is the hinge, we said, between the first 11 chapters and the final five chapters. Between all that Paul has said about God's loving mercy, and then what he's going to say in the chapters ahead, about how to live as a response to that. It's the hinge. This hinge or connection is important all the way through the series. It'd be like saying every message in this series is prefaced by the word therefore. Today, therefore, live as an offering to God. Let's read Romans 12, verse 1 again, and then also verse 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of everything I've been telling you about for 11 chapters, I urge you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's pray. Lord, we are here for your word and for your will. So please, Come through loud and clear in the feeble and adequate words I offer. 
in your glorious name. Amen. As a young man, I was fortunate to finish college without any debt because of a football scholarship. And when I went off to Princeton Seminary, they had a strong commitment to help seminary graduates to be ordained for ministry to leave seminary with as little amount of debt as possible. And so there was an academic scholarship, and I was also given the opportunity to work on campus. So I had a number of jobs. As I pushed through seminary from 1977 to 1981, including a full 14-month internship, full-time at a church in Pennsylvania, where I actually met my wife. But as I worked all the way through seminary, I had some great jobs. I, in the seminary kitchen, I washed dishes. And then I realized you could make more money scrubbing pots, so I switched over to, to washing pots and the, the baking trays. I worked uh, in a nearby bookstore, a used bookstore. I think it's the only time in my life when I have held in my hands a romance novel. <laughs> and we sold lots of them. <laughs> I also worked as a security guard at a venue for music and, and theater that was right there. And by the way, that's not a tough job in Princeton, New Jersey. It was an easy job. And I worked at, at, at a number of different churches. In fact, uh, through that course of uh, seminary, I was at a church in New York, Westchester County, two in Pennsylvania, one in Philadelphia as well as State College, and one outside of Baltimore, Maryland. And so I needed a car. Oh, did I need a car. And my parents loaned me the money to buy a car. Helped me to get my first car, a new one, a, a brand new 1978 red Chevy Chevette. <laughs> a powerful and luxurious car. It was not. But it was what I needed to get back and forth. It was all I needed. Make fun of the money. A little later, when I had an opportunity and a desire to, to make my first road trip across the country to California. Mom and Dad made that possible. <laughs> they loaned me the money. We understood and agreed that I would pay it back. Actually, my dad kept it recorded on a ledger paper. <laughs> now, at every one of those transactions, every loan, and the few payments that I made, they were all written down, recorded. By the time I finished seminary, it had gone on to a second page. <laughs> And there were many more withdrawals than there were in payments. Graduation came along. It was filled with joy and excitement. Bobby and I uh, had been married six months earlier. And we were still new ones. She doesn't know I was going to show this, but I pulled this out. It was, it was a day that was filled with such joy and excitement. We had just uh, finalized accepting a call to serve a church that was a great church in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And it was fun just knowing where we were headed. We didn't have any money at all at that point. <laughs> My parents were there also. In fact, they took the picture. My dad took that one day. Later in the day when the flooring of graduation activity settled down, we were just all together. My parents gave me a graduation card to open and read in a bus. Incredibly. Folded inside the card, were the ledger sheets <laughs> recording my debt to them. I'm sure when I noticed that, it's like I had a puzzled look on my face until I opened up the saw at the bottom of the second page. Down below were all the entries had finished, and there's a tally of how much I owed, and it was still a considerable sum. They had written in bold letters and then circled the words that many of you have guessed already. Paid in full. By the way, I, I still have those pages in my archives at home. And I still remember the surge of gratitude and amazement, the, the emotions in that moment. And uh, paid in full. I mean, they had unilaterally declared that the debt was satisfied. Paid. And it's a, vivid, it's a vivid memory for me. 
of an experience of grace, because I hadn't done anything to pay that off. But it was an experience of grace, 35 years ago. And there continues to be, and I'm, I'm so happy to say this, there continues to be a prevailing grace in our relationships, going the directions back and forth, which I'm sure is a part of why God has called us to be here in Florida at this season of life. I answered a call to Northland and love serving as pastor of this church. But I'll tell you, when the word came through that this church was interested, and it was 11 miles away from my parents where they lived in Eastland, I was stunned. Just stunned. And it's been beautiful to watch and experience through the years how our grace and relationships have flourished and matured. I came down here not because of the sense of duty or obligation. They never tried to leverage that. But our, our sense of delight and gratitude has continued to mature through the years. And we feel so blessed, so fortunate to see how God has woven those things. <laughs> but friends, please don't miss the fact that Paul devotes 11 chapters in Romans to make sure that we would know that all of our debt of sin, all of it, any mistake we've made, any wrongdoing, any guilt that's there that separates us from God, it has all been paid in full by Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, the Roman road is a celebrated way of understanding what God has done. Romans were famous for their road building. The empire was, was famous for, for its roads, for its passageways, for their engineering, durability. But the one that we're interested in this morning is, is one that's referred to as the Romans' road to salvation. Let's proceed along this for just a moment. At milepost 323, you can read, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is all of us. All of us. And at milepost 5.8, we read, God demonstrates His own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He's paid the price for us. And if you stop at the overlook that is 6.23, you see that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then the road sign at 10 and 9 invites a response. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. With Jesus, you are on the road of salvation. He is the way. Right? He is the way and the truth and the life. If there's anyone here this morning who's not already claim Jesus as Lord and Savior, make that decision. In this moment, we're in the prayer at the end of the message, or as the Spirit moves you sometime before the end of the service, make that decision. An intentional and clear, except I accept the fact that for all of the things that I have done wrong or gone to lie or stepped outside of where you wanted me to be, for all of my sin, you have paid the price. Jesus. And I accept the gift that follows, which is eternal life in you. If there's anyone here today who's making that decision to accept those gifts for the first time, or maybe for the first time in a long time, because it's, you feel like you've been away from Jesus a long time, please let, let one of our North Lake pastors know. We want to pray with you and be supportive in any way that we can on your journey on this road, which, which might involve baptism, or some that might be baptism, or, or even a reaffirmation of baptism. If it feels like you've been a long time away and things are sort of fading, baptism is, is a beautiful sacrament. It is a sign, Scripture tells us, it is a sign that, that we belong it is 
a cleansing seal of our salvation. But even more than that, Paul says it's a reminder. He's teaching them on this road to salvation, on the Romans road. He's teaching them, and he says to them as they're going on this tour, he says, remember your baptism. Because it's, it's a reminder that we have died with Christ and then raised to new life in Christ. Like, like we, we do now with some of the folks who want to be immersed. There is a dying and then a rising. Here's the way Paul puts that in chapter 6, verse 4. It's worth reading. He said, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. We may live a new life. The old life is buried. There's a death that occurs. And there's a new life that comes in Christ. Friends, this is the best trade-in imaginable. Trade in a life of sin that we cannot keep for a life in Christ that we cannot lose. And it starts well before our physical death. He's, he's talking about a new life that starts now. It commences now. And this is where Romans 12, 11 comes in. It's, it's Paul describing what does the new life look like? This is where he's trying to describe. And that's why I say to you, we are a therefore community, a living response to God's loving mercy. Paul said, he said that we should offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Now that would have got their attention. A living sacrifice. Why? What happens to most sacrifices? That's right. Most of them are killed. Now there, there were sacrifices of wheat and there were other. But when it was animal sacrifice, just understand that ancient cultic practice, which is repulsive to us today, almost inconceivable, but it, it resulted in something or someone dying. When Jesus went to the cross, he makes the ultimate sacrifice. He, he dies for all of us. In that framework, in that understanding, Paul says, look, he's taking care of that. What God wants for us, from us is a living sacrifice. <laughs> the way in which we proceed to live, live is an offering to God. This is, this is actually how I've tried to understand my life over the decades. Forty years ago, I felt a call to follow Jesus and more specifically to serve Jesus. Once I realized what he had done and really understood it, as a young adult, it's like, it has changed me forever. And I felt a call to, to redirect my life, to be an offering to God. For me, that meant a decision not to go to law school, instead to go to seminary. It's a major turning point. And I did so as a, as a living sacrifice to God. But not because I thought I was going to earn God's approval, win God's favor, merit salvation. No, I, I truly understood that was already taken care of. I wanted to be a response to God. Still do. A way to exhibit my gratitude and delight. But a living sacrifice doesn't mean you have to go to seminary. It doesn't mean you've got to you know, be a pastor or missionary. No, it's an it's everydayness of life. I, I love what Eugene Peterson writes in his paraphrase. And here's what it is in Romans 12, verse 1. He says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. Your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life. You're driving your golf cart, putting on the ninth green, dancing on the square. Whatever you do, life. take your life and place it before God as an offering. Every moment. It's not just what we put in an offering plan or what we have at the church. It's the moment-to-moment -moment 
experience of life that we make as an offering to God. And if you examine verse 2, you see that living in this way entails some things. First of all, it entails a willingness to be a little bit different in the world. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Being a follower of Jesus in this new life can mean we stand out in some ways. It could be a little bit awkward, but there's a willingness to do that. It also means transformational learning. It means learning that makes a difference in how we live. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Learning is not just for the sake of curiosity. Learning that we're after here at North Lake and, and for disciples, it's learning that changes the way that we go about it. It's transformation. And then, then we try to get a sense of well, what does God want and, and how do we fulfill that? Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let me give you an example. A while ago, a boy was baptized with his given name, John. And he grew up in an affluent home. His father was an excellent businessman. He made a fortune selling fine cloth. John's mother was from France. In fact, he got a nickname, Francesco, which was because his mother was from France. John assisted his father running up a very successful business. It was assumed someday he would take over that business. Now he also displayed valor and toughness in a regional war during which he was captured and held prisoner for over a year. During that time he, he became a little bit ill, but survived and made his way back to his home about a hundred miles north of Rome. John was a remarkable young man, creative, thoughtful, sensitive, humble, kind, qualities that, that manifested his growing, his flourishing faith in Jesus Christ. He also, he had a tremendous compassion for the poor, almost to a fault, which was a bone of contention with his dad. But his son was far too generous. Eventually, John renounced the family inheritance. He traded in all the finery that he wore, all that he'd grown up with, to our shabby, colorless robe. He walked around shoes. He prayed and he begged him. What money he got, he, he, he passed it along to those who were truly poor and who were sick. And you know what was amazing was that what he was doing started to get attention. His Compassion for the poor attracted followers. First, just a handful. Then they came by the scores, eventually by the hundreds, to learn from them. What he was doing, why was he doing? By the time he died, about 800 years ago, there were more than 5,000 followers who had organized into a significant reform movement in the Roman church. Very few of his writings survive. But there's one famous prayer attributed to him. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. And yes, that was St. Francis of Assisi. The name that stuck in history was the nickname that he got because his mom was French. And he's still venerated today. Some just think of him as a sort of a sentimental nature lover. That's a popular caricature. But he was so much more than that. So much more. He was, he was willing to be different from the world and the values, including some represented by his own family. And he was transformed from the inside out when he understood what, what Jesus and the gospel was all about. It changed him. And then he became an agent of transformation. For, for many of us, still today. And he, he had a burning love for God and for, for God's people, all of God's creation. He cared about the things that God cares about. That's beautiful. When we care about the things that God cares about. 
And he didn't just care. He threw himself totally in. He didn't mess around with what I might call the disciples' hokey pokey. You know, put your right hand in, take your right hand out. <laughs> put your right hand in. Yes, take your right hand out. Take your left hand, your right foot, left foot, and in. He goes right to throw his whole body in. He doesn't mess around with any part. He throws himself in totally. And then, you know what? He shakes up some others like this. But there's no mistaking. He is totally in what God has done and what he wants to give back. You know, don't just put in a part of yourself for God. Put in your whole self, your whole day, your whole life. When Paul was trying to make this point, and he's talking about baptism, chapter 6, and I finish with this verse, he said to them, after hearing about St. Francis, I want you to know, Paul said to the Romans, offer yourselves to God. As those who have been brought from death to life, offer every part of yourself to Him. Let's do that even as we pray. Let's finish with this prayer. We'll get on the screen, this Romans 12 prayer, and let's share it together. God of mercy, thank you for the forgiveness and new life offered through your Son, Jesus. By faith, I receive your gifts, a desire to be a living response to your love. Therefore, I offer myself and this day to you. Guide me to fulfill your purpose. Amen.